just add like an extra 25 K to the list price, because we knew in two or three months, by the time we renovated the property, it would be worth more than what we thought it would be. That's yeah. how fast things were appreciating in like Oh five, Oh six, Oh seven. They were really, really fast. Um, so it was pretty wild. And you kind of sit there and you're like, okay, it's been doing this for like two years. Mm -hmm something's got to give like it's impossible like nobody will be able to afford a home here yeah. soon right and so we kind of saw the writing on the wall like things are going to happen but we didn't really know what you know we we were very kind of like what is going to happen but i can remember like around september time frame uh it was like crickets ghost town uh -huh. like i mean it was like a light switch i can remember it was september and like i didn't do another deal for the rest of the year oh wow I mean, I was in, I was doing two to four open houses a weekend. Um, anything I could during the week, I was full-time real estate. That was the only thing I was doing. And I didn't make a sale for over 90 days. It yeah. was, it was crazy. It was literally like a light switch. Things just went off. Nobody was buying a lot of those crazy finance programs. They went away. Like mm -hmm. you had um, a lot of the investors who were flipping could do like a negative amortization loan, which, oh, really? yeah. So they, they're basically barely, they're not even paying all the interest. Is. So basically they are paying less than what the actual interest is. So every month their loan amount increases. Shout out Sean. Changing the game through real estate. Yeah. Changing the game through real estate. I can never wait. Got what it takes. It got this on my plate and I got a budget. Teach you how to save. Listen to this podcast. Podcast, you will be amazed. Play this any morning, any night, any day. We're the winning team. We were born to be brave. Yeah, changing the game through real estate. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Just to kick everything off, um, welcome to the Changing the Game Through Real Estate podcast, episode number forty. And before we get started, I do really want to. Um, say thank you for our listeners and crazy enough i think it's crazy that we've actually have listeners like overseas and definitely the ones in germany that keep tuning in every week i really do appreciate y'all support and this week on the podcast we have my good friend brian worst with the worst team and um i'm really glad to hear his story and how he got into real estate i know we've talked about it a little bit but yeah can you kind of tell us like um uh, why like why you got into real estate. I know you've been into it, been in the game for a long time, but why did you kind of originally back when you originally started to get into real estate? It was totally random. Yeah. Um, I had a friend of the family who was flipping, you know, mm -hmm. houses in like the late nineties, early two thousands. And I had graduated college and well, actually during college, I was coming down here cause I was in upstate Pennsylvania. Yeah. And it's cold and nasty. And I was like, oh, I get to go to the beach for the summer and just kind of work. And so I was coming down for summers, um, just helping him flip houses, work on them, do whatever, you know, just kind of, you know, nothing real important, but I was doing it in the summers. And then when I graduated, um, I actually got a bachelor's deg degree in computer science. And I was looking to go work at like Lockheed Martin or things like that. Yeah. And I was looking for a job and uh, he had called me and he said, Hey, um, you know, you want to come down and do real estate again? And I was like, no, I got a, a graduate. I got to get a real job. Yeah. He's like, this is a real job. And I was like, well, all right. What, why not? Is Let's this go. like a friend of yours or a friend of the family? I knew okay. him through relationships with the family and things like that. And, you know, so it wasn't like a super tight relationship, but I knew him and, you know, I had worked with him for two summers in a row. Yeah. And we're still business partners. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, we formed a pretty, pretty long lasting business and, and him as well. But so I came down and uh, we started doing the same thing, you know, flipping houses and now. And, um, you know, so we were like swinging hammers, doing demo work, going to Home Depot, picking up supplies, like everything, you know, we were doing everything ourselves. It was like a, you know, he had a couple like helpers, but we were doing a lot of the work. You yeah. know, like I said, we were swinging hammers, putting up siding, uh, landscaping, painting. I mean, I painted so many houses and um, we got done and he's like, hey, why don't, why don't you try to sell it? This is what we do. And, you know, and, you know, try to do it before it's ready, like a for sale by owner. Yeah. Because we always listed with an agent. Yeah. But the agent wasn't us and we had to pay him. And, 
you know, um, I put one up there and did an open house and I sold it. So did you get a agent, a license before then? No, or was this... I, we were just I was for sale by owner. Uh, like okay. we, oh, yeah, it was, right. you know, cause you know, as long as you're a owner or an employee of the entity that owns the business, you don't need a license. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, so it, it works like that. And um, so I sold it and he was like, Whoa, <laughs> like, dude, that was awesome. Uh, can you do it again? I'm like, sure. So I just started selling the properties that, we were flipping and really I say we, it was really him. It was his yeah. business, but I was there helping and doing everything. And, um, but it how was, long ago was this? This was like, Oh, four. Oh, four. Oh, yeah. wow. I worked with him for the summer of Oh two and the summer of Oh three. And then I came and worked for him full time in Oh four. Ah. And then, um, I'd sold a couple houses and he was like, you should get your license. <laughs> like you, he's like it would really help out the company you you could make some more money like so i was like okay so i started working every day at like 7 30 8 o'clock and then when mm -hmm. i'd get done at like 4 30 5 o'clock i would go to real estate school till like 9 10 o'clock at night uh, okay so long couple of weeks you know like non-stop <laughs> just yeah. non-stop work real estate school work real estate school finally got to the end took the class test passed it scheduled my psis passed those and then all his homes uh we started listing on the mls i was working for like wainwright because i had yeah. worked for a couple of companies like wainwright remax and um you know better way realty we ended up starting yeah but so i worked for them and then wainwright kind of changed some things that they didn't want owner agents to sell a bunch of properties and that's all i was really selling yeah. You're just selling your own deals. Yeah. And they didn't like that. So we ended up kind of switching and then like about a year and a half into us working together, he was like, let's start a company. Yeah. I'm so young. And he doesn't have his, he doesn't have his license. Uh, he does have his real estate oh, license. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah. He does have his real estate license now. Cause he wanted access to all the information, mm -hmm. you know, cause being an agent, you can access the MLS and things like that. So it was good information, but I was doing all the listing paperwork, all the selling, you know, open houses, all that stuff. And so then he came to me and he's like, Hey, let's start our own real estate company. And I'm like, Whoa, what? <laughs> it, it, it kind of escalated pretty quickly. Yeah. And so he ended up really starting it then. And uh, I just kind of worked there and worked with him for the first couple of years. And then once I got my broker's license, that's when, you know, I kind of became partner in the business and started running it, yeah. forming a team really doing true full on real estate sales. And of course, this is like the worst time. It's 08. Yeah. Like the market's in the tank and here I am getting my broker's license. Best starting. time to be in real estate. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, everybody's getting out. I'm jumping head on yeah. in and and you know, we found a niche and we were working with investors and everything else and we just kind of grew the company. So what did, um how did y'all go about finding deals back then? Like I know things have changed so much with the internet, but how did you find all the deals back then when you were flipping uh flipping? Man, it, to be honest, it was just old school sales, signs yeah. out in the, you know, handwritten signs out in the yards, on the street corners. Um, you know, there was like different ways to do foreclosures back then, you know, you but that's pretty much what it was finding foreclosure deals, yeah. you know, word of mouth, talking to people, signs, like, you know, just mm -hmm. getting out there. And there wasn't a whole lot of competition like there is yeah. now. So it's definitely a lot harder now. So since you uh, brought up 08, that's like, kind of like, so how was that time? I've heard some people explain that. So like going into the real estate market and y'all were flipping, how, how did that like the market crash? How did that like, Tell me like a typical, how that day went. Oh man, it was like a light switch. Yeah, it really was. Um, you could kind of see the writing on the wall because things were appreciating so fast. Yeah. Um, I remember when we were buying homes and we would just add like an extra 25 K to the list price because we knew in two or three months, by the time we renovated the property, it would be worth more than what we thought it would be. That's yeah. how fast things were appreciating in like 05, 06, 07. They were really, really fast. Um, so it was pretty wild. And you kind of sit there and you're like, okay, it's been doing this for like two years. Mm -hmm. Something's got to give, like, it's impossible. Like nobody will be able to afford a home here yeah. soon. Right. And so we kind of saw the writing on the wall, like things are going to happen, but we didn't really know what, you know, we, we were very kind of like, what is going to happen? But I can remember like around September timeframe, uh, it was like crickets. 
ghost town. Uh, like, I mean, it was like a light switch. I can remember it was September and like, I didn't do another deal for the rest of the year. Oh, wow. I mean, I was in, I was doing two to four open houses a weekend. Um, anything I could during the week, I was full-time real estate. That was the only thing I was doing. And I didn't make a sale for over 90 days. It mm-hmm. was, it was crazy. It was literally like a light switch. Things just went off. Nobody was buying a lot of those crazy finance programs. They went away. Like mm-hmm. you had, um, a lot of the investors who were flipping could do like a negative amortization loan, which, oh, really? yeah. So they, they're basically barely, they're not even paying all the interest. So basically they are paying less than what the actual interest is. So every month their loan amount increases. Huh. I don't even think those exist anymore. I haven't Probably seen them. Um, they had interest only type stuff. They yeah. had 80, 20, where people would do a, a, an 80% LTV loan, but then they'd finance their down payment. So they'd oh, finance so yeah, their 20. Yeah. So it was hundred percent financing. Yeah. And then they would get people to pay their closing costs. So a lot of people really didn't have any money into the property. They would do adjustable rate mortgages, you know, a lot of not great lending going on at the time, yeah. you know, really, I don't want to say they trap people, but people got into loans. They probably shouldn't have <laughs> not really understanding them. And, um, I mean, they're great products when used in the right way. Yeah. And I think it was a accumulation of all that stuff just happening. And then a couple of years later, all those rates started to adjust. Yeah. Things started to happen. People made less money. Foreclosures went rampant. Um, and then prices just fell. So you were killing, you were doing like two or three open houses a weekend and then all of a sudden the light switch went off. So what did you have to do to like pivot after that back in 08? Like how did y'all, how did y'all survive? Like same thing. I mean, just back to, you know, people still had to buy and sell yeah. in every single market, whether the rate is 18% or 2% or 10 or nine, whatever it is, there's always people that are going to need to buy. Right. People are always going to need to, there's a couple of reasons they're going to, upsize because their family's growing yeah they're going to downsize because their kids have left and gone off to school or got married um you know death is a big part of it people die and you know their kids inherit property um you know their their investments become too much or they're ready to cash out like people are always looking to buy and sell right so there's always a market for it and so i just stayed with it and i just kept you know, going out and meeting people and talking real estate and, um, had a good clientele, treated people, all my clients very well. So they, they referred me to people. And ultimately, like after those three or four really quiet months, it started to kick in, started to figure it out, started to gain some traction. A lot of agents left the business and then slowly just started to, to rebuild, you know, um, and started bringing on people to work with me because I had business. I had the investors that all the foreclosures came out. So the, yeah. the investors that were there, I had already known them all because I had been flipping for a while. They started buying again. And I was like, well, buy with me and I'll, I'll list for you, you yeah. know, and I'd, I'd give them a deal. And then I slowly built up this investor network where, you know, I had three or four or five investor guys that were always buying mm-hmm. and always selling. And then I was getting sign calls, open house leads. And then I realized, oh man, I got all these other buyers from my listings. And now I need some people to help me run those around. So that's what got me into forming a team. So what happened else. about the flipping business when like you're flipping and then the crash happened? Like, obviously, did y'all still flip through that? Yeah, or? we flipped the whole time through. Did yep. y'all get burned a couple of times or... Uh, a, a couple in the beginning when the market shift, right? Cause like a, the it, initial, the initial part. Yeah. Some of them weren't great because you bought them and you're a three month lag trying to, you know, renovate them and all that. And then when the market kind of just went down, you were stuck with still the old pricing. Yeah. Got burned on a few, but then, like I said, the floor, foreclosures came out. And you were getting some pretty good deals. Oh, I got and then, so the flipping just kept going and I flipped all the way through it. Like my business partner now he flipped his own and I flipped my own, you know, we kind of separated yeah. when I got my broker's license. Cause I started running the real estate company more mm-hmm. as opposed to being a flipper an investor. I still had rentals. I still did flips, but I was not, my main focus was the, the real estate company mm-hmm. and I still flip. I mean, even to this day, I still on average probably flip at least one, or two a year. Yeah. You know, I still do it. I still find a couple of deals and I like to do it, but it's not my main focus anymore. I gotcha. So 
if you could go back to then, you said you lost money a couple of deals. What would you have done differently? Like, would you have had a, like a, a, a more of a spread on your numbers, or like a softer um, LTV or when going in? Or I mean, I think at any point in time, you just have to forecast it sooner. Yeah. You have to be able to predict or at least forecast what's going to happen. That would be the only way, you know, because you, it's really hard to control when something just drops off so quick because real estate is very, it's a long, it's short term, but it's still long term. Like yeah. you buy a home today and you have to renovate the whole house, it takes time. Yeah. Right. A lot of things can happen. And I mean, just think you buy the home today, you're making the decision, you're writing the contract, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're forecasting the price to be X based on today's market. You could, you might be able to sense some things going down. So you're conservative, but you're still saying it's a good market. It's still this, and you've got, you know, depends on if you're paying cash or you've, you're doing some, some financing, you've probably got, you know, two to three weeks to close. Yeah. Then you've got what? 90 days to rehab. You're tearing yeah, out kitchens, windows, right now. So you're really like four months into it. You're trying to forecast four months ahead of time yeah. and to say, I'm not going to lose money, but it's hard to convince a seller, Hey, the market's going to crash in four months. So I need to buy it here. Yeah. You know, there's really no way to avoid that. Yeah. That, you know, so what you can do is you can just hold those properties. If you buy, where mm -hmm. if you buy them where the spreads are negative, because the market shifted in your rehab, um, you could just hold them, keep them in your rental portfolio. And then when the market comes back. Yeah. And I know a lot of people that did that. You know, I'm one of them. I kept a few that I just wasn't able to sell or wasn't willing to lose that money and they could rent and I kept them. So a lot of what you said about the 08 crash kind of correlates to kind of like uh, what you see a lot of times now, like you saw like massive appreciation in two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously that happened. Yep. The uh, rates are going kind of up like crazy right now. Yeah. Man, that come maybe kind of happened, but so how do you see the correlation between what the 08 was to what it is now, like similarities and what are some differences in your opinion? Cause you were like in the heat of things. Yeah. I, I think it's way different. Um, I think, yes, this market got real inflated very quickly, but I think a lot of it was due to it crashed so hard, right? Yeah. It took a long time for prices to get back to where they were mm -hmm. and, and not even saying that like, yeah, on, on average, you know, you can anticipate like two to 3% appreciation on real estate, right? That's average per yeah. year. And you have to think from like, Oh, eight to 2012 or 13, we had like no appreciation. That's like true. Everything was going down. So, you know, you take those four or five years and you're like, well, that's 15% on average that they should have gone up. And so it took them a long time to just get back to where they were. And then things got back to where they were. The economy is going pretty good. People recovered from a lot of those, you know, bad things that happened in 08. Um, and the market started to take off again. And we had really the millennial generation is huge. Yeah. They, they blossomed very late into homeowners. They didn't buy super early like some of the previous generations. Yeah, I feel like it was like, like all of a sudden it was like, boom, mm -hmm. like, like everyone I knew was trying to buy a house. They're a big generation and they, they came flying into the market and it was just, I don't want to say it's a perfect storm. It's just timing, you know, yeah. because like it's a very weird time. It, it was a weird time so. because things had been so very flat or very little appreciation for a long time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it starts to take off and then a whole new buyer pool jumps in, you know, a whole new generation jumps in. There's a lot of them. Yeah. And, you know, so it just started taking off and um, there was no way to cool it down. And then the pandemic made a lot of people realize they didn't like their home. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you're stuck at home for, you know, no one's going to work, no one's doing anything. We thought it was going to crush the real estate market. Yeah. We, we all thought, oh man, we're not going to be able to go show a house. No yeah. one's going to want us in to sell it. And after a few months, like it just did the opposite. People were like, if I got to stay home, I want a home I want. Mm -hmm. And then from there is what kind of just spiraled into a huge, massive appreciation market. So what I will say is why I think it's different from 08, getting back to your original question, yeah, is 
the offers that we're writing, the offers that we're seeing, the things that people are doing, there's no 100% loans unless you're military, you know, mm-hmm. and, and they deserve it. Thank you to our military. They, they yeah. deserve to have 100% loan. Like I've, I deal with a lot of military families and what they go through and what they do. And I'm like, whoo, like you guys deserve all those benefits, you know, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other people, the, you know, the regular workers and all that, like they have to put money down. You know, you've got the VA loan, which is 100%. FHA, you got to put down at least three and a half, but then you've got mortgage insurance. So your payment's a little higher. Conventional, you got to put down anywhere from like five to 10 to 20%. Um, you know, and then there's some other loans like the, the USDA loans in the more rural areas, but you know, you, you don't have many options to choose from. So either way, you got to put out a down payment. Yeah. Not only that, sellers won't pay in your closing costs. So you had to pay for your closing costs. So the difference that I see between the 08 and this market is that people back then had 100% financing, closing costs paid, you know, they didn't really have any skin. They had adjustable rate mortgages too. And they they didn't have any skin in the game. So when the payments got adjusted, things got heavy, all they were really walking away from was a house. Yeah. And they were going to damage their credit. But now if... I don't really don't know what the market's going to do. I don't feel like prices will fall because I don't feel like people are going to just give away their home. They have money into it. They like it. So I don't feel like we're going to see that same thing. We're going to see a slowdown, but I don't think it's going to be like 08. So you, you do a, high, a lot of high volume sales right now. Um, are you seeing for like a lot of your listings? Like I've seen like a lot of price reductions that we haven't seen, but I, I feel like it's also like, the sellers kind of have unrealistic expectations and a lot of the, even the agents have very un, un, unrealistic expectations. They just say, Oh yeah, I can make it at that. And you, you nailed it. I mean, that's exactly it. it it's um, agents that are, you know, inflating the price because either a, they, they want the seller to hear that number and get the listing or b the seller is like, no, no, I see this and this is what I want. And they're, they're willing to agree to yeah. it. And you know, I always go in with my sellers and I'm very upfront with them. I'm very realistic. And I, I tell them like, Hey, if we want to shoot for the top of the top of the market, the time frame is going to extend. We've got to find that right buyer. If we want to go at fair market value. So the higher your price, the smaller your buyer pool, the lower your price, the bigger your buyer pool. Yeah. And realistically, you want to be on that line. Like no one wants to leave money on the table. I get it. Right. Mm-hmm. But also you want to have some points to negotiate. If you're going for the top price, you might have to agree to some terms that you necessarily don't like because your buyer pool is so small. Yeah. Right. So are those terms worth the wait? And are you going to get that higher price? And how long can you wait for it? But if you go at fair market value, your buyer pool is a little larger. And then you might be able to get some multiple offers where then you can negotiate some of the terms you want. And obviously, if you can go below fair market value, maybe you'll still get a bidding war because that still happens. Like I'm still seeing multiple offers. I listed a property and both sides. You know, I listed a property two weeks ago, multiple offers, still got a cash offer for my seller. There you go. So it's still happening. Yeah. Um, And then on the flip side, my buyer, we found a nice house and he was competing against multiple offers again. We did escalation clause. So It's just a matter of the pricing will generate like that seller probably really wanted X amount and listed below. He probably got more than what he originally wanted. Yeah. And everyone's always talks about the crash. And I think, um, uh, don't quote me on it, but I think Morgan Stanley predicted that like a 10% market slowdown by the end of the year. But I was like, is it like even considered a crash if like the last two years we've seen like 25% like an up appreciation? Right, like, right. Like yeah. Is it just go- balancing out? Like I It's even- kind of balancing out. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, they say a recession is two or more quarters with, mm-hmm. you know, things are negative. Yeah. But really, we increase so much so fast. I, I, and that's why I don't see prices falling. I mean, again, I could be way wrong. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but from what I see is that we're still very short on inventory. Yeah. We, the interest rate hike has removed some of our buyer pool. It shrunk the buyer pool down because some people now can't get what they want or they're a little uneasy about it. But you know, the great thing about it is like, look in the eighties when the rates were like what, 16, 17% people still bought, 
you know, and you know, if you find the right house, you can always anticipate. I never, your primary residence should not be an investment. Yeah. It is. That. But so, why, so why do you think that? I, uh, you have I to know, have a place to live Yeah, always, right? Whether you're renting, you buy, you're staying in a hotel, you stay with a family member, you always have to have a place to live. It turns into an investment, but if it's what you want and where you want to live, like what makes you happy? Where do you spend time with your family? What do you, you know, what are you doing at your home that makes you happy? Is that really sure? I guess you can call it an investment, but I have to have a home. I have to have a place to go. So I don't call that an investment. Does it turn out to be one? Sure. But really like since I've owned, I've owned my home since 05, it skyrocketed in 07. The price dropped after that. And now the price is up again. But really, if you look at it, did I gain anything? No. I'm in the exact same spot. Mm -hmm. Until I sell it, then I guess it can become an investment. But right now, it's just a home. So I remember we had this conversation. You bought an investment property back in 08. Mm -hmm. And you you were cash flow negative every single month. Can you kind of explain like that scenario? Like when you bought it, like, well, let's tell the story that you told me. Yeah. Why like buying for the long term is still is still a good a good good deal because you made money in the long run. I did. And real estate to me, like I said, I'm a computer science major. I knew nothing about real estate until I started doing it. And then I realized that there's so many avenues to invest in it, work in it, earn a really good living. Like there's a lot of things you can do in it. And I was pretty young and I saw everybody buying and I finally had enough to buy an investment property. Yeah. And sure enough, I was bought an investment property. <laughs> I'm in real estate. I still bought it the worst possible time. Like you, you bought it 08, right? I bought an 08, yeah. like right before, like so, uh, maybe five or six months before it got bad. And did you have an adjustable rate mortgage? No, I, that was a fixed. Okay. Yep. So you yeah, made one good. <laughs> I made, I made one good decision, right? Um, so it was a fixed rate and um, we renovated it and I put it on the market and I couldn't sell it. Yeah. It just wouldn't sell. And I had a choice to make. Do I just keep paying the mortgage payment? Um, or do I put somebody in there and alleviate some of this pain? So I put somebody in there. And I think at that point in time, just using round numbers, my mortgage payment was like maybe 23 or 2,400 close to it somewhere in there. And I think I rented it for like 20, 2,100 or 2,200 a month. So yeah, I was losing a couple hundred, a couple month. hundred uh, a month and for years, you know, this person stayed there for probably two or three years and the prices again, like I said, they stayed very flat for a while. So this might've been 2011 or 12. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to sell it again. And now it's been lived in cause I had it recently renovated. Yeah. So it's really not the appeal. It still looks lived in now. And it's so I was like, okay, prices haven't really done anything. I'm not going to try to sell it again. I'm just going to rent it. So I ran it again. And um, now the rents had gone up a little bit. So I was getting like maybe 2200, maybe 2250. So almost, almost there. Almost there. But I'm still, <laughs> and the way I looked at it was like, I'm really only paying $150 a month or $200 a month to have this house. Yeah. If I were to come to you on the street and say, Hey, um, in 30 years, you can have this house and your payments only 200 bucks, but you have to deal with the tenant. Yeah. Sounds like a great deal, right? Yeah, that's true. You know, so in hindsight, yes, I, I made it in my mind say, Hey, I'm only really paying 200 bucks a month to own a house. Eventually, like the house is eventually going to pay itself off. Um, a couple of bad months where the tenant moved out and I mm-hmm. couldn't find one right away. So eating a mortgage payment or two it went it went south pretty quick but finally the market started to turn and prices started to go up and it was kind of like perfect timing where my tenant was like hey i'm getting you know deployed to i forget where he was going but he had been there quite a while he'd been there like four or five years yeah he's a good tenant he was in the he was in the navy um really good tenant did rates ever go down where you can refinance they did actually go down and i i refinanced it a little bit so i got my payment closer to what the rent was uh but right there towards the end um inside that four or five year stint um the i refinanced and the rent went up so i was actually like making like 50 bucks a month what yeah (laughs) 
and nowhere near what I lost to get there. Yeah. Um, but then he moved out and I said, all right, I'm going to put some money into it. The market's really good. I, I painted it. I put new flooring in, put a new roof on it, uh, updated the HVAC. And then I sold it for like 75 K more than what I bought it for. Hey, yeah. And so after all was said and done, I ended up with a profit. Yeah. And if I would have held on for two more years, add another, you know, probably hundreds, at least 50. Yeah. So I really feel like as real estate's never a bad investment, as long as you can hold on to it. Yeah. You know, cause even all those years, like it was a long process. Um, but at the end of the day, calculating everything from start to finish, it still made money. Yeah. Cause I always hear the saying, it's like, um, t- uh, time in the market always beats time in the market. Cause technically you bought at the worst possible time. Mm-hmm in the last 20 something years, um, in real estate during the crash, kind of, uh, suffered through a couple years, refinance yep. years down the road, you turned the money. So as long as you can hold the real estate for long enough, I feel like you're never going to lose money. I think that's a very good, uh, philosophy. Hey. And I love that story. And I wanted to make sure everyone yeah, yeah. can relate because a lot of people have that fear of like, okay, well, if I get in the house, what happens if, uh, if this happens, this happens? Well, if you, if you, if you get the house and you hold real estate long enough, I think you're going to make money in the long run. Cause I feel like that. Yeah. I mean, even in the, even in the eighties, you know, I hear stories in California Yeah, and those people would kill to have their home back now. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. cause their prices plummeted. They, you know, people lost money on that real estate. They paid way too much for it. And then in the nineties, they could barely get rid of it. And then like, imagine if they held on to it for, you know, let's just say <laughs> 30 years, <laughs> they would have like probably 20 X their investment. Yeah. They'd be millionaires right now. Oh, over, you know, I mean, you can't touch California <laughs> yeah. for uh, under a million. Oh I mean, yeah. Yeah. For and, anything. And, and you know, actually for anything, like. nothing. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and certain areas do better than others. So I will say a little asterisk on everything that I'm saying for people that are out there like, Oh, I, I don't know about Detroit or, you know, Midwest, <laughs> but yeah. I will say in an area like coastal Virginia that has the beach, that has the military, our real estate that has like stable fundamentals, very stable, yeah. very, very desirable area, good climate. Because so, I feel like we're kind of a hybrid market because we kind of yeah. have, we can, can kind of be cyclical. I feel like the up and downs, the land prices are kind of, kind of can be kind of expensive, but I feel like because we have such a big military presence here, mm-hmm. it kind of makes it like really more stable. It, ins- it insulates us a little bit and we have a resort city, you know, we have a, yeah. we have a nice ocean front. You know, yeah. I think it's crazy that people come uh, come vac- vacation here, but I, <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, I can see maybe just cause I lived here so long, but yeah, you know, you live here and you kind of take it for granted, but I yeah. mean, you know, just driving up to the Eastern shore and like going up, like it's beautiful here. Sometimes mm-hmm. we forget that we live in such a really, really nice area. And this is <laughs> why people come to visit. Like yeah. I'm driving, I'm like, man, this is in my backyard. Yeah. That's you true. know? So, um, and then even, I'm also oh. licensed in North Carolina. So northeastern North Carolina, like Outer Banks and stuff like that, like really good market. Yeah, and you know, Currituck is growing, Moyoc, all that is. So why did why did you um like because you named your company the Better Way Realty? What's what's the better way? You know, a, a lot of different things um kind of went into that name. Mm-hmm. Um, sound like you're like, might've been pissed off at your other brokerage. Well, this no, is a better way, you know? <laughs> no, not really. It was more about the client. Yeah. To be honest, it was, you know, I saw how, and, and again, my, my business partner had a lot to do with it too. And, yeah. and the, the theory was we wanted to make it a marketplace that was not just your traditional real estate, you know, place. Like you could come here, come to our brokerage, come work with our agents and you got a better experience. You had more opportunities. Like, cause we were doing a lot in real estate then, you know, we, yeah. we were flipping, we were doing this, we were doing that. Like, so the name came because we wanted it to be a better way, not for us or the agents. And it is, it, it is for us and the agents, but also the client experience. Yeah. So many times like buyers and sellers really don't understand what goes into being a real estate agent or the market or how it works. Mm-hmm. And so, and a lot of agents sometimes don't really give that information back to the client. Like, 
how it works. So we're kind yeah. of to blame for like all of that. Yeah. I remember so, like helping people that have just like, it was like their second time buying a house and it's like, they still had no idea the process. I was like, then she, then she get this explained the first time. I'm like, no, I was like, okay, well, I got you. I got yeah. you. And, and so that's why we named it a better way. It's a better way for the client. We're not going to treat you like client A is not getting treated like client B. Seller A is not getting treated like seller B. Like everybody has different needs, different wants, different goals, right? right? Some people want the highest price. Some people want the fastest sale. Some people need a home today. Some people need a home in a year, right? Yeah. And if you treat everybody the same way, it's not going to make it a pleasurable experience or are they even going to understand it? So a better way comes around, like we're going to make it a better way for you, a better experience for you. Yeah. You know, we care about the client. Like I've built my whole business on caring about my clients, mm -hmm. staying in touch with them. You know, it's hard. I agree. Like, you know, when yeah. you sell a lot of homes, it's hard to stay in touch with them. But I, I always try to like circle back, say, Hey, how are things going? How are, you know, here's the market. Here's this, like, it's hard. Yeah, you I know, know we've been to lunch. And I feel like you do know everyone. <laughs> I, I try, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it is really hard. And even for like some clients that, you know, you only see one time, mm -hmm. you know, you still try to say, hey, uh, and I've had people come back to me 10 years later. I don't know if you remember me. I'm like, oh, no, I remember you. You you bought this house. And they're like, how do you know that? And I'm like, you once you're my client, you're my client. You don't yeah. get, I save your number. I save your address. All your stuff is saved with me. Mm -hmm. And they were like, wow, I can't believe you remember. It's been 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so like, you know, you just build those relationships. So building your uh, business, um, I feel like business is so much like, uh, so much about serving. So how did you, did you have to make any like transitions to in like, like internally things you had to work on about, cause you were a computer science major and then you went into sales and like helped serving others. Like, how did you, did you have to like find your, find yourself in order to really like, like focus on caring, uh, caring for people, solving their problems. It's more like a servant's attitude. Yeah. Um, I probably should have never went into computers. <laughs> <laughs> So not good with computers. No, I'm great with them. Yeah. But I enjoy the human interaction. Yeah. You know, and I've been in sales pretty much my whole life. You know, like I worked at Sears in high school mm -hmm. and I was selling like electronics and appliances and I'd always been around people and I had always been good at, you know, cause I just treat people the way I want to be treated. Yeah. It's the easiest part in sales. Like you don't need to be, a greasy, slimy salesperson to be the top seller. You just, how would I want to be treated in this situation? And that's how I treat them. Yeah. You know, and that's worked for me. I don't know if it'll work for everybody, but it worked for me. Like I just treat people the way I want to be treated. So when I'm buying a car, I'd like to be treated this way. Somebody yeah. who treats me that way, I buy from them. I'm loyal from them. I understand what it takes to be a salesman. Yeah. When I buy a house, I know the things that I want. And that's where I would say like, it gets a little tricky because now for me to buy a house, I've purchased so many, I have to bring back that whole first time home buyer thing. Like, how did I feel when I first yeah. bought it? And I try to bring that experience back. Like putting yourself in their situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And remember like, you don't, they don't know what this is. They have mm -hmm. never been. So I, that's what I do. I feel like that's a very good like skill set in general, because like a lot of people, I feel like don't, no one really thinks about from the other person's perspective. And like, that's one thing I like I've learned and in getting into real estate in general and business is trying to see like from their perspective, like, mm -hmm. Hey, how does this person feel? And it's like, Hey, how do you, how do you truly help that person? I think that's a very good, I feel like maybe more pe uh, people should be doing that. I feel like the world would be a better place if, if they did. It gets so, harder. Yeah. I agree with you, but it does get harder because the speed of things move so yeah. fast. I think that took away a lot of the personal connections. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember writing contracts on trash cans and coffee tables and yeah. car dashboards. And, you know, we spent a lot of time now it's digital signature, this digital signature that you don't get that face to face a whole lot. You yeah. know, there's agents that I've worked with that I've besides looking them up on Facebook, I don't know what they look like. Yeah. That never happened before. <laughs> yeah. You know, you hand delivered your contract and said, this is my client's offer. This is what we offered. This is why we offered it. This is this. They're pre-approved here. Like I got yeah. to present my offer to the agent and then the agent got to see me shake hands. Then they took the offer and went to the seller and said, 
Yeah. This is their offer. Now it's all everything's now digital. it's all digital. Yeah. You know, I'll send somebody a 40 page contract and I go over the highlights with them on the phone. I'll send it to them. And in five minutes, I got it back. And I'm like, did you read everything? You good? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah no, we're good. We, we looked at all the things you told us were going to be in there. It's all good. Okay. So I always heard like, like, cause growing like a business is no easy thing. So how did you like from the very beginning when you originally were going to start your business, what are some of the like failures that you that happened along the ways that that you could learn from now or that you had done differently um learn to to delegate out more yeah you know it took me a long time to hire my first assistant i did a lot myself yeah um trusting other people you know because it's a it's a service industry right so when something gets screwed up it it looks bad on you. Yeah. You know? Um, but that's really it. Like I, I should have, um, just trusted people earlier, sooner to do it because they can. Um, and you know, just coaching and training, Mm -hmm. you know, I love to coach my agents. I love to, you know, train them, show them how I do things and constantly just learn. Has that been harder now? Cause there's, there's like, I feel like there's so many agents. There's a lot. And, you know, the agents that work at my brokerage and on my team, like, they're awesome. Yeah. Like, they're really good, you know. And some are better than others, but the others are getting there. And they get to see all the the highlights of some of the agents that are there. And it's pretty amazing, you know. And I just feel like I want to share. Like, I'll share with anybody. Hey, try it this way. It works. Like there's, there's enough business for us all to. So how do you get balance between everything? Like, Hey, you got, you're kind of, you do flipping every once in a while you Mm do uh, run a business. You have a bunch of other things going on. How do you find like a work-life balance between, cause like real estate can drag you in so many, so many ways. So how do you find like, like a balance between things? That's tough. Yeah. That's and it tough. might not be a balance, but I've, I've talked to people and asked that question. It's like, oh, I have no balance. <laughs> I mean, I really, um, I enjoy the business. So that helps. Yeah. Um, it's an addictive business. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. I guess when they say, you know, you never work a day in your life if you love what you're doing. Yeah. There's some things I hate about real yeah. estate, right? You know, when deals go south, yeah. problems are like, yeah, there's always those days, but um, I love doing it. I love coaching. I love sharing. I love learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I also love my free time. I love, you know, my wife and my dog and, you know, so yeah. I do make time for that and I wasn't good at it. Uh, mm-hmm. and it took me a real long time and I'm still not great at it. You know, I still will work nonstop and on vacation and things like that. But, um, I definitely just set some boundaries of like, okay, you know, like sometimes when I'm going on a date night with my wife, I give her my phone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it says blowing up. Yeah. It, it, that way I'm not distracted by it. I can stay engaged with her, you know? Um, and then we just set time to do things, mm. you know? And, and it's just, and it's just an appointment. Yeah. Right. That's all I call it. You know, like, Hey, we're going to go to lunch and somebody says, Hey, I'd like to see, I've got an appointment. How about this time? And I just stick to that schedule and you have to set yourself some time to be y- your own person, right? You have to set your, your, yourself aside some time to relax and, you know, clear your head. And if you don't, you're just going to run yourself ragged and things are going to get frustrating and stressful. Like I set time to go to the gym. Yeah. You know, I, you just, they're appointments. That's no one needs to know what I'm doing. It's an appointment. Yeah. Right. And not that I'm hiding anything from them. You ask my clients, man, I work for them all the time. Yeah. Saturday night, Sunday morning, Monday, Tuesday, went like, yeah, it's there's, like, there's like no, it's like definitely a 24 hours. Yeah. That's there's what. no day off, but I do have appointments and that's just how I do it. Yeah. You know? Cause I know, I know a lot of people and including myself, like we kind of got into, uh, became a real estate agent, like as a kind of a side job. And I didn't realize how much time consuming it is. It, like it was, it's so time consuming. It's like 24, seven, mm-hmm. <laughs> seven days a week. Yeah. It, it gets a lot. And, and that's where like, you know, having a team is nice Yeah, because like I try to give them as much as I possibly can, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I want, you know, we'll turn in, some some new leads or this or that like hey i've got a appointment you can go on you know i don't take them all 
Yeah. I, I try to give out as much as I possibly can, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so if, if I allow them to run those leads and be successful, then ultimately the, the brokerage is, is right behind them. So how do you find most of uh, your leads? I know that's the, the hardest thing for like a, a new agent is to find leads. Um, I had a pretty good book of business. Yeah. Um, so I still do a lot of sales for my investors. So we get a lot of sign calls. You know, I'm trying to get better at social media. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, my website. I do some radio advertising. Um, I'm a Zillow Flex partner, mm -hmm. you know. So what's I, that? Zillow Flex is basically like, you know, we've partnered with Zillow. Um, there's a handful of teams in the area that get selected based on their performance with Zillow and what they do and mm -hmm. if their models are set to grow and, um, you know, Zillow contacts you, they interview you and they select a handful of people in each area and say, Hey, would you like to partner with us? And, you know, we'll, it's nothing exclusive. It's just yeah. a partnership back and forth. And as many people as I bring on, they'll, they'll supply business to pretty much the whole team. Oh, I gotcha. But there's certain metrics and things you got to do. It's not yeah. just, yeah, you know, I, you, you've got to work and earn that business. So what would be your best piece of advice for like, I know you work with a lot of investors, like when they ask you like, Hey, they're not sure if it's a good time to buy. What do you, what do you tell them? Every investor portfolio is different. Mm -hmm. What are you looking to do? And I think that's one of the biggest things is like, you need to understand somebody's goals, goals and what they're looking for. And it's tough. You're not always going to find the agent that understands all that stuff, Yeah. but they at least, you have your real estate license. You've sold some homes. You kind of, you at least understand the, the basic concepts of it, but there's a, there's a market to invest in everywhere. And there's certain things you can do. Like I have guys that only buy condos. Yeah. It's all they buy just condos. And I have other people that won't touch a condo to save their life. Yeah. I'm not personally not a fan of condos, you know, but, um, I think it's cause you're, you're right. It could be like, it could be like a older, older person who's just trying to buy all in cash and yeah, bring it, bring his portfolio in. So it's easier to manage, Yep, but it could be different for just someone who's growing and needs a certain level. Of cash I need all the doors to, I can. Yeah. I gotta, you know, and that's just what, where they're at. Like, what are you trying to do? I think understand what they're trying to do and you can kind of line them up, you know, because there's flipping, yeah. there's buy and hold, there's Airbnb, um, you know, there's a ton of ways to do it. So what about you as an investor? What are, what are you looking for? I'm looking for Airbnbs right now. Um, I've got a couple rentals that are really solid. Yeah. Um, I've got really good long-term tenants in all of them. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one flip, well, two flips going on. And that's about it. You know, I, I keep my portfolio. So why Airbnb? Why Airbnb? Um, I just feel like it's a pretty cool way to uh, get more income out of a property. Yeah. Than just doing like long-term rental. Yeah. And you're pretty well diversified. So it'd be a. Yeah. Good... Cause I've got my long-term rentals. I've got some flips and now I want some Airbnbs, you know, yeah. just kind of diversify in all of it. So when you analyze a Airbnb, what are you looking for numbers wise? Um, you know, there's always a, a peak season and an off yeah. season, right? There's events that happen that draw more. So I'm just really looking to um, at least have everything covered expenses, maintenance. Cause when you Airbnb, like you've got to own the furniture, you've got yeah. to, you know, so there's a whole nother like level, a small hotel. Yeah. There's a whole nother level of what you've got to supply. Like you've got to have, uh, internet, you've mm -hmm. got to have the utilities on like when a, a traditional rental, the, the tenant pays for all that stuff, Yeah, you know? So, um, you just really want to be able to make sure that all your expenses are covered. Um, and that you're, you're making a little bit of money to cover the mortgage each month, but then also those slow months, Yeah, you want to make enough in those peak months that you have enough to cover those slow months where nobody wants to go to the beach in February or, yeah whatever it may be, wherever you are, if maybe you're near an outdoor concert venue, I mean, you can Airbnb just about anything these days. Uh, not so much in this area, but in other States, like, you know, you can just Airbnb just about anything. Yeah. You just gotta be uh, careful about that. Cause you can get a cease and desist. Cause yeah. Got a couple of those. Yeah. Um, but, um, so does interest rates, uh, change your perspective at all? Cause I know they're going up and it's harder a lot of times to cash flow right now. Yeah. That makes things challenging. Um, 
the numbers have to make sense. Yeah. You know, you have to be able to run your numbers and understand what they look like. Even with the rates going up, like there's still deals out there. Yeah. And you can always refinance, right? I mean, there's always that opportunity. And if, and imagine like, so somebody put it to perspective to me today. Um, like, just imagine if like your ideal rate was like five. Yeah. And today it's six. And you're like, well, I'm not going to buy because it's not five. Well, what if in three months it's seven? Now what are you going to do? Yeah. Like, right? And then- We're in three months, it's eight. <laughs> right. <laughs> it it, it could keep going up. But let's just say I wanted five. I got six. It went up to eight, but now it's down to four. You can refi. Yeah. Right. And you, and there's so many different programs where you don't have to start over. Like if you did a 30 year or 20 year, depending on what you buy, you can just say, all right, I want to, I want a 25 year. I want a 20 year, you know, yeah. or, you know, they have refinance programs where you don't have to start back over at 30. Yeah, you know. I know um, a lot of us because they said that uh, like, yeah, you're buying the house, but you're buying the house at that price. But it doesn't mean you have to keep that rate for right. 30 years. Like, yeah. in my personal opinion, just uh, like my personal opinion, like one of our guests mentioned, he thinks it's about like a year and a half before uh, rates go back down to a normal. And I think he, I think he's pretty I think that's pretty safe to say. I think that's what it would be. I right. think we could see a couple little dips and increases throughout yeah. the next year. You know, I, and again, I don't have a crystal ball. Yeah. So we're just guessing. We're all, yeah, we're, we're all, all, we're all making guesses. We're all forecasting. And I guess that's what makes the, you know, the real estate world go around is no one truly knows. Except and, Jerome Powell. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> Jerome Powell knows. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, if your numbers make sense, right. Yeah. Then make it happen. So what's like, uh, you got all this stuff going on. Like what, what keeps, keeps you motivated? Like what's your, like, I always ask everyone this question. Um, what's your why? Like, what's your why in life and the business that you keeps you a grind? Cause you've been successful for a kind of a long time. What do you, what keeps you going to get up the day and keep going and on and on and on? Well, first off, I can't sit still. <laughs> so I got to do something. Yeah. Um, I enjoy this and you know, like I do want to make a, a good living for my, my family. And, mm -hmm. you know, I want to be able to enjoy some things that, you know, some, my family didn't get to enjoy growing up, yeah. like nice family vacations. Like don't get me wrong when I'm vacation, but like, I want to go do some things that we didn't get to do. And, yeah. you know, I see other people doing them and I want to know, Hey, how'd you get there? Yeah. And, you know, work hard, you know, you, you get out what you put in and mm -hmm. uh, it's, so my drive is pretty, pretty big. And, um, you know, I just want to build a successful business and be able to, you know, provide the, the life for me and my wife and my dog right now, no kids yeah. that, you know, I, I wanted. And, um, so far it's been best of both worlds, man. I get to do what I like doing and I, you know, have done very well at it. Luckily and you get to work out with great people at the gym. That's right. I got good people <laughs> to work out with. Hey, working yeah. out. Um, I will say, uh, one of the best things that I've, I've started doing. Uh, several years ago was, um, you know, working out. It, it feels great. It's miserable to get oh, yeah. into it. Definitely. If you so, work out where we work out, it's miserable. It, it's miserable. Like, <laughs> it, but you know, yeah. once you get past those first couple of weeks and you create a routine, like working out is just, it's part of my day. Yeah. I got to do it. Um, and then one thing that I implemented yeah. here in the last couple of years is I get up around five or five 30. It's great. I get so much more accomplished. I, you know, I get things done and then throughout the day, I can kind of feel like I still work, but I'm able to interact more where yeah. in, before I was getting up at like seven, rolling into the office at eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock. And I felt like I was always behind the, behind the eight ball, you know, because I was like, man, yeah. I got to get this done. And then people will try to come talk to me and I'm super busy and that still happens even though I get up early, but I feel like I get a lot more accomplished by eight or nine o'clock than most people do in a whole day. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. So your best piece of life advice would be one would be work out. And the second one is get your day started early. So you get your, it. get your day going, organize it, have a plan. Um, and even today, man, I was a little late, like, yeah. you know, things happen, but like have a plan, get that workout in, you know, take care of your body. You'll feel way better. So do you have like, when you set your goals, do you set your goals like, hey, I want, uh, I have like three months goals, year goals, ten year goals, 
because I've, re- I've been reading the book uh, Attraction that's up there and it talks about like your 90 day world and it talks about like every 90 days like you stay focused you're trying to hit these 90 days and if you have any more issues you pile it on after those 90 days because I'm kind of like uh, you have probably talked to me multiple times it's like I'm all over the place I'm very big big picture but I kind of have to hone in do you have anything that like tries to keep you grounded and keeps you focused you know um writing down your goals yeah helps uh, i have a coach so he holds me accountable there you go you know so i think everybody needs to have somebody that holds them accountable yeah that's good point. and and writing down your goals and looking at them and, and it's okay not to hit your goal it's totally fine yeah it's just setting a goal is the most important you know not having one it you don't there's no way to track and measure what are you doing yeah it might feel right might feel good it might be comfortable but write it down look at it track it see see what happens yeah because i feel like if you don't time flies so so much it goes fast and you know like i have my goals and um you know so far i've hit them you know yeah. and there's goals i haven't hit but that's okay they're coming what are those? i understand the process i, I want a larger a larger scale team, Mm -hmm. you know, but it's tough. It's not, I want to also have the right people. Yeah. You know, because I have to go to work and be side by side with these people. And they need to share your vision and your passion. Yeah. Also. Yeah. And, um, you know, I feel like I got really great people that work with me and, um, you know, I I love it. So, but you know, um, those goals will come, you know, they'll, they'll be there. We're putting the processes in, we're taking the right steps. So they're coming. So well, I know you own your own brokerages and I know you want to grow that. There's so many brokerages out there. What really makes y'all different than the rest? Cause there there's, there's a lot and definitely I feel like coming up, there's always a new one. There's always a new one, you know, and I'm not going to say anything bad about any of the other ones. They all have their yeah. pros and, and cons, right. You know, everybody. And it's just the people you're around the location, like, it, there's just a lot. I mean, I can't say one brokerage is better than this. Cause they do that. Like, you know, everyone has their niche. Yeah. Everybody has their feel, their culture, their environment. And, um, you everyone's know, everyone's like, situation is different. Yeah. Like I'm a very hands-on active selling broker. You know, mm-hmm. my agents call me, I need help. I'm there to help them. Yeah. You know, where sometimes in other brokerages, you might not get the broker to help you right away. You might have to go through a couple layers to get to the broker, like a yeah. associate broker or a managing broker or a team lead or, you mm-hmm. know, but I'm right there for, for, for anybody really. Yeah. Even if it's just an employee at my office, like, what do you need? You know? Yeah. So it's just a, a good, you know, and I like to share and train and coach. Like if somebody comes to me and asks me, how do we do it? Like, let's go, let's figure it out. Yeah, I feel like I've I've realized that about you. I feel like that's one of your big passions. You love coaching and uh, I do. coaching people. Yeah, How, like here I'll tell you where I screwed up. Try it this way. Yeah, you know, like I'll I'll never give anybody advice that I wouldn't take, or I won't make somebody do something I haven't done. Uh, like I said in the beginning, I was swinging hammers and demoing walls. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I was doing four open houses a weekend. Like, I won't tell anybody to do something. Unless I did it wrong <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, do it this way, but that's about it. You know, it's, mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of what I, what I thrive on. So I know there's a lot of flippers out there. I know you flip. Do you have any piece of advice for them for about doing the numbers? Cause I know you got burned a couple of times on the uh, back in 08. Would you do more of like a, be more conservative on your after repair value? Like what would be your piece of advice for them? I think the biggest piece of advice is um, knowing your numbers, you know, knowing what, your acquisition costs are because yeah. you know HGTV kills me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's not real, folks. <laughs> Just it's not real. No one, no <laughs> one buys it for two hundred, and they put in a hundred and sell it for four hundred and make a hundred. The numbers don't work. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so, what's the profit margin usually on flips? It it depends, yeah. right? Uh, and and again, that goes back to like there's any type of investment can be like. Would you take a house in Virginia Beach that you know is going to sell no matter what, any day, any time, and take a ten thousand dollar profit? Sure. Yeah, depending on depending how much work I have to do. Right. Between. Right. Again, depending on how much work, but you know, like this home is very sellable. It's very desirable. Yeah. Your your profit margin doesn't have to be huge because it's very low risk that you're going to mm-hmm. sell it. You know, it's going to make money. Um, or as opposed to let's say, I'm buying one in a not so nice area. 
It needs a ton of work and it's going to take the right buyer. But if all the stars align, I can make 50 grand or whatever, you know, I don't know if I want that deal. Yeah. It goes back to what you said about the buyer's pool. If you have a small buyer pool, it's probably high risk. Yeah. Cause I think like, um, starter homes around here, I don't think you can lose because they can't build those anymore. They don't build them anymore. So you have that scarcity aspect of it too. So I I think if anyone's buying those, I think you're pretty safe because they can't, they can't build those or make them anymore. Yeah. They're not making any more dirt. We have the dirt we have, we have the land we have, They're, they're not getting any more of it. And, um, but yeah, I just think it just depends on what you're really trying to do. Like if you're just looking for some quick capital or capital, buying an area that you know is very desirable, that yeah. you know the numbers are solid. They might not be the best, but they're solid. Um, you can swing for the fences on a deal. Just know like, okay, it might fall short of that and I'm okay mm-hmm. with it, but do I want to take that risk? So when you ran your numbers originally, were you trying to be all in around like 70% uh, ARV or did, like, how did you kind of break down your... your uh... You know, I, I always factored in you know, the, the cost of the property plus acquisition. Mm-hmm. Um, I still finance a lot of my deals. So I figure in interest, my holding costs, yeah. my taxes, my insurance, my utilities. Um, my goal is six months on all of them. So I yeah. factor in six months. So if it happens in four, you yeah, know, my numbers great. are good, right? I'm conservative on that. And then when I look at my resale, you know, I, I know what the top market is. And I know what fair market is. And I usually go right about just below fair market. And kind of gives you that cushion. Gives like, me hey, that I cushion. get you to get this, but I I'll, know I it'll for, sell for this. Yeah. I know it'll sell for that. Yeah. Um, and then I just back out, you know, closing costs, commissions, um, grantors, like all those things you got to pay yeah. as a seller too. Right. So I just factor all that. And then I see where my spread is and and again, it does depend on where it's at. Like if I know it's like a Virginia beach home, that's going to sell and no problem. I don't need to make a 20% return. Yeah. You know, I know it's going to be a solid 10 or a solid, whatever. Um, but on some of those other ones that may take, Oh my gosh, I got to do roof windows, plumbing, electrical HVAC. I got a new deck. I got to redo. Like yeah. if I'm going to put in that much work, I want a larger return. Yeah. You know, if I'm just doing like the cosmetic type stuff, like, add a kit or, you know, redo a kitchen, a bathroom, paint and flooring. I don't really need a huge return on it, Mm -hmm. you know? So I got you. And and everybody's different. Some people are like, I'm only doing it if I'm making X, but my mentality is if you do enough of them at Y, eventually you make way more than X. Yeah. So I agree. So what would be, uh, just to wrap everything up, do you have any like last piece of advice for our listeners? You know, I mean, just invest wisely, understand the areas that you're investing in because they're all different. Um, And just make sure you understand the numbers. Yeah, that's I I think once you understand them and you know what's going into it, it's it's hard to go wrong. You still can. But holding on to it, it seems like in real estate, you'll always get it back and have a good team and have a good team. Yeah, and really having the team behind you um, or right next to you in yeah. in the trenches yeah. it helps because you, without you know help from good people and trusted knowledge like if you're not a real estate agent and you're investing make sure the agent you're using understands it like yeah. they're giving you good information you know research it double check it your contractors make sure that they're they're solid you know just in, in all aspects just make sure you know what's going on because it can get sideways quick yeah i got gotcha. you well, um, where can, if people wanted to hear more about you, where can they find, find, find you? Um, you know, you can go to my social medias. Um, you can go to my website, um, betterway.com. Um, you can read my bio. Um, all my info's on there. Um, I'm in Greenbrier, but, you know, I'm, I'm slowly getting out on social media. Yeah. We talked about that. <laughs> um, so uh, Facebook and Instagram, really. I know TikTok's out there. I haven't (laughs) dabbled in that yet, man. I'm still a little old school, but I'm getting out there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, that's pretty much where you can find me. And, you know, my cell phone's out there. I answer it. Yeah. Give me a call. Email me. I'll respond. Yeah.